This video is sponsored by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform to build your beautiful online presence and run your business. Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here. Well, last week we talked a lot about the crazy ramp up of speed at Starbase. This week though, this was beyond nuts each and every day. Starlink flights are returning once again, but why the delay? Along with that, we have updates on the delayed Starliner mission and also on the unintentional rotation of the International Space Station, which was actually much more extreme than first reported. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. So once again, what an unbelievable week that it has been at the build site at SpaceX's Starbase facility in Boca Chica. Each week we get mountains of comments from people that haven't really ever followed this before, just amazed at what they are seeing. The Starship and Super Heavy Booster collectively is the largest rocket to ever be created, and it will hopefully complete its test flight to orbit successfully soon. The mainstream media really doesn't cover this amazing story, unless of course there is some sort of explosion. We here cover this every Saturday in detail, and this week has been quite the incredible one, with SpaceX continuing that massive ramp up of activity, arguably even faster than what we were seeing last week. The biggest news I think is of course Booster 4. The first grid fin was lifted and attached last week just as we were preparing our video to go live. Within a day, all three others had joined the show. Under the cover of darkness, they were mysteriously painted black with no photographers catching this happen. Eric X tweeted a render of the new grid fin design saying that it looks like non-folding grid fins on BN4, guessing that this is a case of best part is no part. Elon replied here saying yes. Now this is interesting as we of course know that Falcon 9's grid fins do indeed fold. That feature is being eliminated on Super Heavy as this is just another mechanism which adds unnecessary complexity, mass and failure modes. Musk also added that grid fin designs work but they don't necessarily maximize the payload, something with much more drag to reduce terminal velocity and reduced landing propellant might have better performance. So yes, it looks like the grid fin control in general could be up for further changes. Anything that helps to use less propellant for the landing burn should mean an increase in payload capability. So at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, Booster 4's liquid oxygen tank was lifted and mounted onto the booster transport stand in preparation for stacking. Then at just after 3 p.m., the bridge crane was attached to the methane section and up that went onto the rest of the vehicle at 4.30 p.m., making this the third booster to be fully stacked. More importantly, of course, this is the first orbit-capable booster to be created, with the other previous two being just Pathfinders. Almost a week ago, Elon shared a stunning photograph of the enormous Super Heavy Booster prototype saying that SpaceX are installing the Starship Booster engines for the first orbital flight. You can see just how massive the booster is with humans for scale in the image shown here below. On the Sunday evening, a massive amount of progress was made with Booster 4's engines as all 29 of them were mounted in a single night. This included nine Raptor center engines making up the full central cluster. These are set up with one in the middle, plus the eight circling the center. Together, these provide the control authority for the booster in flight via thrust vector control, or gimbling as it's quite so often known. That is very important throughout the flight, as without them, the booster would have very little roll control, meaning less overall authority of the entire full stack. Now, I mentioned 29 engines earlier, so that means that there is still another 20 to address. Those are the Raptor boost variant. These engines are fixed in place, meaning no gimbling at all, but they produce the majority of the thrust on the ascent. The 20 of those engines were the bulk of what was seen that late night. It sure did provide quite the show for Nick here who captured nearly every engine that went into Booster 4. Be sure to give him a follow there on Twitter as he's capturing many photos out there now on a daily basis. Thanks Nick. So continuing on, the 20R boosters they are commonly called were installed in a timely manner along with the nine other gimbling Raptors. On average it looks to be taking only 30 minutes to mount each engine. That is astonishing considering 29 engines isn't even the final goal for SpaceX as it currently stands. We expect that Booster 5 and 6 will still have the 29 engines, but Booster 7 will probably include the 33 engine thrust structure. This would be amazing as four additional engines on top of this 
would be providing even more thrust. And more importantly, it gets the booster closer to the 7,600 tonne thrust mark, which Elon Musk targets as the ultimate goal. Faster engines installed means faster testing, and SpaceX doesn't seem to be slowing down at all in the near future. If you want to know a little more information about each and every Raptor installed on Booster 4, check out Artsius's diagram here on Twitter. He was up all night there with Nick to log and record the exact engines mounted. On Tuesday, an intermittent road closure opened at 9.30am, ending much later in the day at 3pm. In that window, Booster 4 was rolled out of the high bay at 11am and made its way out of the facility and onto Highway 4 30 minutes later. Elon shared these two photos along with this stunning video as it rolled out of the site, just showing the sheer size of this beast. As Booster 4 entered the launch site, we were provided with the amazing views of the two boosters in the exact same shot, a first there for the Starship program. The obvious difference between Booster 3 and 4 is the gigantic grid fins coated in black there, but also added stiffeners on the interstage so that it's strong enough to hold Ship 20 on top. So now we move over to the mid-bay where Ship 20's tank section was rolled outside on Monday ahead of the attachments of the aft flaps. The first flap was installed that afternoon, and just a few hours later the second was lifted into the air and attached as well. As we mentioned last week, these aft flaps are around 20% narrower and lighter than previous versions. Almost a week ago now, the first Raptor vacuum engine for Ship 20 was delivered to the build site and removed from the truck that night. The next day, another two appeared, however, only one was removed, leaving this white one. So with those two that were delivered and removed off the trucks, along with the one that was delivered several weeks ago, there were three Raptor vacuum engines on site for Ship 20. All of those were then, of course, installed on August the 4th, and interestingly, this is the first time that we've ever seen this wide rim plate here. Now, is this for the support? Support of the vacuum engines? Is it just for general stiffness or maybe to even assist avoiding plasma spill during the re-entry? Perhaps it is all of the above, I'm not so sure. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Along with the three Vacuum Raptors, we of course see the three gimbling C-level engines there in the center. In that image shared by Elon, you can even see that one of these is labeled 57. Well, Booster 3 used engines 57, 59, and 62, which leads me to believe that S20 could be using the exact same three. So with all of that, this is yet another new milestone, as we've never seen more than three Raptor engines on a Starship prototype, and we've also never seen Raptor vacuum engines installed before either. Altogether, Ship 20 could be capable of producing more than 1,250 metric tons of thrust in a vacuum, which I believe makes it the most powerful orbital rocket stage ever assembled. So with Ship 20 moved into the high bay, it was time for the nose cone mate. That was being prepared at the low bay, and after it was stacked on top of the barrel last week, it was then time to attach the forward flaps. On Sunday morning, the installation was underway with it receiving its first forward flap, sporting those thermal protection system or TPS tiles on the windward side. Then on Monday afternoon, the second forward flap was lifted and soon installed as well. More and more TPS tiles were added throughout the week, and then it was time to roll the nose cone over to the high bay at 9pm on Wednesday night. Just hours later, the nose cone was hooked up to the bridge crane and the lift was underway. Overnight, that was stacked on top of the tank section, completing the first ever orbital starship. Now, for quite some time, the community has been wondering what payload will be placed inside of this nose cone for its orbital flight. Thanks to Eric X here asking if there's any payload for the orbital attempt, we now have an answer for this. And interestingly, it follows in the footsteps of SpaceX's very first orbital flight of Dragon in 2010. Starship's first payload will be a wheel of cheese. So next we're going to head all the way over to the launch site to check out what has been happening there. We'll talk more about that in just a moment, but before that a very big thank you to Squarespace today for sponsoring this video. Squarespace of course is a fully managed solution providing everything that you need to get a new website presence up and running. With all of the simple tools included and with pretty much zero web development skills, you can start up a free trial and have a site set up in just hours. The template systems and the content management 
management included is amazing, but it's equally as important to have simple and quick integrations with the many services out there. You can so easily link your social media accounts to display that content on your site automatically. That just gives you immediate synergy to what you publish and you aren't needing to re-upload that work. It could be Instagram, Facebook, Twitter or Pinterest. More importantly for someone like me, you can embed video content from YouTube or Vimeo and have them up on your site in just a few moments. Perhaps you create incredible audio with Spotify or SoundCloud. Those options are all available here as well. If you want to check it out for yourself, just head to squarespace.com slash Marcus House and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. You'll find that link in the description below. So yes, over to the Orbital launch site, we've also seen a mountain of activity. Last weekend, two large cranes were connected to the Orbital launch table via two load spreaders, and then it was lifted and placed down on the six pillars a little over an hour later. Elon posted some stunning shots of the dangling table with the caption that Starbase is moving at warp nine. That is certainly true. He also added that the table weighs 370 tons and that it needs to be level and match the booster fittings. Of course, on Wednesday morning, the crane was then promptly attached to Booster 4, and after waiting for several hours, lifting finally began at around 3pm. Once it was out of the transport stand and into the air, we finally get to see an unobstructed view on how much the Raptors there stick out. Then out that rolled on Thursday in this amazing scene that we see here by Cosmic Perspective and NASA Spaceflight. Incredible coverage as always. The full stack was looking like it would go ahead, but the wind was looking a little high. However, on Friday, that was the day when history was made. The stacking of the largest and most powerful rocket ever built was about to commence. At 7am, it was lifted off the stand, raising into the Texas sky, and in no time at all, there it was, the historic full stack together for its test fit. We were just glued to the live stream at this point as everyone celebrated with SpaceX playing Fly Me to the Moon over the loudspeakers. Just imagine seeing this colossal beast lift off as rendered beautifully here by 3D Daniel. So yes, there it was as shown by Brendan Lewis here with the rest of the updates at the time. That full stack was short lived however, down it came again just moments later before being rolled back to the high bay. Just incredible shots from everyone at Starbase capturing all of these firsts. Additionally, we see more black pipes continuing to be delivered this week for the catching arm system. When asked on Twitter if there is a render of how the catch of the booster will work, Elon replied saying that he will post once we have a decent simulation. Saying all that, if it's an animated simulation that you want, the amazing Eric X here on Twitter has you covered. He published his own render here of the landing that Elon himself said is very close to real. He also added that the arms are able to move during the descent to match the exact booster position. The catch point is off to the side just in case this fails, as you don't want to hit the launch mount directly. The booster is then transferred back to the launch mount for the next flight with a turnaround of under one hour. That is all astounding stuff. Now part one of Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronauts interview and the tour of Starbase's facility came out this week, as I'm sure that most of you are already aware. Just a few quick points that I thought were particularly interesting. Firstly, the grid fins for the Super Heavy booster will be permanently extended as mentioned before, but they are now electronically driven. That is a change from the hydraulic systems used on the Falcon 9 booster. SpaceX also has decided to remove the hot gas thrusters from the booster, and instead will use the ullage gas from the tanks for attitude control by having four vents spaced 90 degrees apart. This seemed strange at first, but the gas would need to be vented either way. It can now be used to do useful work to the vehicle instead, while also eliminating the mass and complexity of the hot gas thrusters. Furthermore, the Raptor version 2 is in the early stages of development with some subcomponents being built with testing of a completed version 2 possibly within the next month. They're also aiming to eliminate a dedicated stage separation system and will instead rely on angular momentum to separate the stages similar to Starlink deployment. I imagine that the booster would simply pitch up right at engine cutoff to induce a slow rotation. Separation would then occur and then the two would drift apart for a few seconds before the stages fire up. Elon also dropped some interesting numbers on the go here as well. Apparently the booster is planned to hold 3,600 tonnes of propellant and the dry mass is all 
already stunningly light, only around 160 tonnes. Each of the grid fins here are around 3 tonnes as well. The residual propellant that's needed after landing is planned to be around the 20 tonne mark, quite a bit below the usual 1-2% to that you would normally expect on a vehicle. Raptor version 2 is expected to have around 298 bar in the main combustion chamber, which will result in quite a low area ratio. There is loads more information crammed into that interview, so do check out Tim's video when you get a chance. Now, in last week's episode, we covered the docking of the long-awaited Russian Nauka module with the International Space Station. Not long after docking with the Svezda service module, it unexpectedly fired its thrusters for around 15 minutes trying to pull away. It has since then become clear this week that the gravity of this situation was actually much more significant than initially thought. The entire space station rotated much further than the 45 degrees widely reported, but it did so very slowly, so slow in fact that the crew on board would have been largely unaware when the issue first began. In fact, it turns out that the station actually rotated around 540 degrees, or one and a half full rotations, with it being finally stopped while upside down. Both the thrusters on the Svezda module and on the Progress MS-17 spacecraft were both used to arrest the slow spin, then reverse it back, of course, some 180 degrees. Scott Manley did a simulation with Blender to demonstrate the rotation observed. A link to that is in the description below. I think the thing that is most concerning to me about the incident is that it could have been much worse had the, had the thrust capability of the vehicle been higher, or if there was much more fuel on board. I wouldn't be surprised at all, actually, to see a number of new policies come into play to ensure that such a thing can't happen again in future. Luckily, NASA did insist that the crew on board the space station were never in any serious danger, but this did cause the initial delay to the launch of Starliner's Orbital Flight Test 2. Sadly, before the launch attempt was actually supposed to go this Tuesday, Starliner ran into some problems of its own. Due to the unexpected valve position indicators on Starliner's propulsion system, there was an indefinite delay announced. That also required the entire rocket to be returned back to the vehicle integration facility for detailed inspection. Based on what we've heard since then, Star Starliner needs to be taken back off, and there could be substantial work to be done, so this may push the launch back months. As always, it's best to be certain that everything is fine before risking a launch, but yes, it would have been great to see the mission take place this week. Greg Scott, of course, was excitedly capturing everything before the scrub. Just keep in mind how much time it takes everyone to be out there at the pad to bring these shots to the world, even when a launch doesn't happen. Thanks for the dedication there, Greg. A few updates on Starlink with launches back as of next week as well. It has been a long time between dedicated launches with the last one going up over 10 weeks ago now. True that there were a few deployed as well in the Transporter 2 mission at the start of July, but why the lack of launches all of a sudden? I've had no shortage of questions about this lately with many people worried that this was due to the recent legal action. The delay actually hasn't been anything relating to the lawsuit filed by Viasat as far as I'm aware. That lawsuit was actually rejected anyway by the Federal Appeals Court a few weeks ago. Not that I was overly surprised by that. When the competition is trying to slow you down, that is a very good sign that industry disruption is coming. So yes, the delay is actually because there are no more launches needed for the first initial shell to support near global coverage. That was completed months ago. There are actually four more shells to go on top of this eventually if SpaceX are not restricted in some way. But before that, the next step is to actually place a set of satellites into new orbital planes, with the first of these launching from Vandenberg Space Force Base. So why is this a big deal? Well, because these will be the very first dedicated batches that will be placed into polar orbits. This will allow coverage to the remainder of the planet, not served by those that were placed into the typical 53 degree inclination planes. As you can see here, this covers the vast majority of the world, but if you live above or below the shell here, there is simply no coverage. That is about to change, and also these new polar satellites should finally have laser in to satellite systems unlike those that have come before as suggested by Elon Musk back in January. The idea here is that the new satellites will have this capability as well from early 2022 onward. That will mean that SpaceX can pass data between satellites as well as the ground stations rather than simply bouncing up and down to the nearest ground station. Once those laser links are in place that makes it more of a true network. In the majority of cases of course in populated areas a simple transfer of data up and back down is really all that's needed. 
connected anyway. But for transmission between much larger distances, the laser network can come into play in the future. And that is really where one of the main benefits of Starlink comes in. Interestingly as well, the Starlink app has had a significant upgrade, adding a feature that makes it easier to find clear areas of sky to diagnose connectivity problems. Already the service is being utilized by over 90,000 users over 12 countries. And given that this is still in the beta phase, I think that is quite impressive. Keep an eye out for the next launch this coming week. So yes, that is another action-packed week. Thank you very much for subscribing and watching these videos here every weekend. As a regular viewer of our content, a patron or YouTube member, you are supporting what we do. If you love the design that you see on this shirt, you can pick that up on a bunch of our great gear as well. That really helps. No matter how you support, know that it contributes massively to what I do and allows us to increase the time that we can collectively spend in research, editing and quality control. If you love what we do and you'd like to help assist us, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash Marcus House or you can join up as a YouTube member via the join button below. Either gives you access to chat with us more directly via the assigned Discord roles. You can also have your names listed right here like these other wonderful supporters. And you can also get earlier and ad free access to these videos to watch before anyone else. A massive thank you especially to the production crew and the quality control squad here helping me research and proof the material in these videos. If you're interested in these topics and you'd also like to keep up to date, remember to follow here on Twitter at Marcus House. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from the channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.